My name is Liz Larson. Welcome to the admissions virtual presentation about nursery through grade four. I'm the lower school assistant director of admissions. I'm also the assistant director of communications here at Ross School. And I've been at the school for seven plus years. I started as a freelancer and um, joined. Both of my children have attended Ross. My son is a senior right now. My other son has graduated and is in college. Um, one of the things that I think is my favorite aspect of Ross School is that, you know, as I saw with my own children, they're two very different learners coming from just vastly, you know, different places of interest. They have both thrived at Ross School. And I think that speaks to the way that we teach the um, interest of the faculty in every individual student, and also just the connections that they're making through our very innovative curriculum. I'm going to get into the curriculum shortly. Um, I wanted to start, I'm going to share my screen and so wanted to start with the mission of Ross School. Our mission is to change the way education meets the future. You can read the rest, but it, that really, I think, says it all in a nutshell. Um, Ross is, um, it's just such a unique place. The, the curriculum starting with a focus on cultural history and a real focus on problem solving, creating 21st century problem solvers. Mrs. Ross started Ross School for her daughter. So Nicole, her daughter was in a very prestigious New York City school. She was in four walls and Mrs. Ross went in and said, why is my daughter who can literally have anything she wants in the entire world? Why is she in, you know, inside four walls? She should be out traveling. She should be out seeing the world through, you know, experiential learning. So she planned a trip. She and her husband, Stephen J. Ross, who is the CEO of Time Warner, they planned a trip for their daughter, Nicole, and her best friend, um, Nikki, and they set off on literally a world tour. And halfway through the tour, her husband, Stephen Ross, got sick, and they had to come home. So on the tour, they had mentors at every stop. They were petting pandas. They were walking the Great Wall. They were participating in, you know, culinary experiences. They were you know, immersing themselves in, in culture and history and art and science. And um, so the idea was, you know, if, if I can't have my, if I can't take my daughter to the world, I'll bring the world to my daughter. And that is really um, the crux of how Ross School originated. It's also why we have so much uh, art and artifact all over the campus. Mrs. Ross was a great art collector. She is, um, for those of you who don't know, she is still alive. She's very much alive. Um, she's retired from the board, so she's no longer a participating member of the community, but her legacy is just immeasurable. So who are we as Ross School? We're a community of 21st century problem solvers. We're encouraging students to um, you know, develop a set of problem solving skills. I mean, anyone can look at Google and find out information, right? We all have that at our fingertips. And, you know, if our children are young, they soon will have that at their fingertips. But what do they do to synthesize the information they have? What do they do to critically connect that with other information to be problem solvers? Um, you know, I think the hands-on learning aspect of Ross School is, is one of the most valuable parts of the curriculum, it's, um, you know, it's what helps the students really bring everything together. We are a community of international students. We have boarders, we have students from nursery through 12th grade, we have boarding students from sixth grade through 12th grade. We are 385 students in total. We have around 110 boarding students uh, this year from 20 countries, and 20% 20 of our boarding students are domestic students. It's 
If you're looking at the lower school, we have 120 students in the lower school. That's a bigger number this year than it has been in previous years due to the fact that so many families have moved out of New York City and made the Hamptons their home. Even if temporarily, we're really enjoying having so many kids filling the lower school. This year, um, you know, we have, it's kind of a, a strange thing to explain, but as of two and a half years ago, we had two campuses, one in Bridgehampton and Butter Lane, one in East Hampton. Um, the Butter Lane campus was the lower school and the uh, East Hampton campus was the upper school. Before Mrs. Ross retired, it was always her vision to have one school and one campus. So she consolidated the two campuses, the lower school closed, we put that property up for sale and the lower school students came to the East Hampton campus. Everything worked out well, everyone was happy about it. It, it you know, was a beautiful thing. We loved having everyone on campus and then COVID hit. Um, since we still had the Butter Lane campus, we were fortunate to have a lot of space so that all of the distancing uh, protocols were able to be carried out at the Bridgehampton campus um, and the East Hampton campus because we had all that extra space to work with. So we're very grateful that we were able to reopen that campus. It hadn't sold as of yet. Um, the intention is, as we see it right now, to potentially keep that campus open for a second year next year and then sort of figure out where we are as we right size. So right now the average class size is 11 students. There are some classes that are smaller um, in the older grades, fifth and sixth grade, there are you know, more students than that, but they have two teachers. So all in all, the class size right now is about 11. The daily schedule is 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. I know that a lot of parents wanna know, well, how long is my child in school? And you know, is there bus pickup and all those things? So the daily schedule is roughly 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. We're still negotiating pre-K and nursery for next year. We're not exactly sure what the hours will be, um, but generally speaking, it would be somewhere roughly nine to three. Um, for the, for the pre-K and nursery programs. We typically under normal circumstances have after school programs that run from three to 4 p.m. Um, those would happen on campus. We have a tennis bus that goes from, um, from the lower school to the tennis center, which is right here on the East Hampton campus. At the center of Ross School's community is our core values. And the core values are listed here. Interesting story. Um, about five or six years ago, the, um, we had seven core values. The students had an interaction with this particular person, Lama Tenzin, who is, a, 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 I think, a Tibetan monk who came to campus year after year. Lama Tenzin would come, he would set up a sand mandala, the students would watch the sand mandala develop over the course of a week, and they would have meditations with him, and he would have discussions with them, and they'd talk about compassion and love and why we need to love each other and take care of each other. At the end of one of these weeks, the, um, I think it was the fifth or sixth grade students said, well, why isn't compassion one of our core values? And the teacher said, well, that's a really good point. So they made a proposal to Mrs. Ross to add an eighth core value of compassion to the existing list of core values. And she agreed. She, you know, she enjoyed the fact that they, they recognized you know, where something could change. They recognized that something was missing and they took action to solve the problem that they saw. So this is a real world example of you know, Ross School's um, core value, not only the core values in action, but also um, the ability to evolve. You know, we're a new school and we try things like trying to open a campus for one to two years and, you know, maybe move and maybe not. Um, we've tried having Mandarin and Spanish as dual language requirements. And then, you know, people asked us to only have Mandarin. So we transitioned to Mandarin. And then in subsequent years, we've added Spanish back. So, you know, we're able to change and evolve. And I think that's an important lesson for our students as they become grown ups and they see how fast the world is changing. You know, we have to be adaptable. And we've never been so sure of that as we have been in the last few years. Meditation, as you saw in the list of core values, meditation and mindfulness are a big part of, of how we operate here. Um, you know, students are equally given wiggle breaks and also time to meditate. Um, a few years ago in our professional development, our teachers were all trained in leading meditation. And we feel this is a really important part of, um, 
you know, just giving them a moment and having them gather their thoughts so that they can center themselves and approach their learning from a place of, you know, of real confidence. Academics, of course, you want to know about the curriculum, right? So global cultural history is at the center of the Ross curriculum. As you can see from this curriculum flower, all of the other disciplines, we call them domains, they all center, they all, they all sort of um, overlap from the center of cultural history. We also operate from uh, in chronological order from the beginning of time, which begins around second grade until the end, uh, <laughs> not the end of time, that's <laughs> um, not the end of time. In, um, progresses up to, through 11th grade, studying up till modern day. So um, 11th grade would comprise, for instance, the industrial era up through modern day. 12th grade is a recapitulation of all of time in the context of the evolution of um, consciousness. So it's really looking back at different parts of the curriculum. But everything's overlapping. There are a lot of interdisciplinary projects, which I'm going to explain, you know, by grade level, um, a few examples of that. Our spiral curriculum is like no other. Um, this is the spiral, this is a screenshot of the spiral interactive. And um, I will put a link in later to, um, to show you how you can go in and interact. But basically, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but all of these colors are representative of the curricular units. And it goes up by grade from kindergarten through grade 12. And you can click on any one of these rectangles and see um, you know, the curricular unit and how many, um, all these little dots represent different parts of the curriculum, different domains, and then you can see how they overlap. So, um, for instance, the, um, you know, the dots you can see on here that are overlapping, you know, a green and a blue or, a, um, an orange and a red and a green, those would be, you know, science, performing arts and, uh, math all interacting in a, in a curricular unit. There's a lot of that going on all the time. The other layer of it is core values also layered in with the curriculum. So there are a lot of teaching moments and developmental uh, milestones being looked at and, and acknowledged throughout the curriculum. So we'll start with nursery. The theme of the nursery year is connections. Three units they study are the harvest, the sun, moon, and stars, and the weather. And the focus is on social learning and hands-on play. So in this particular um, image, we see this year's nursery class. They are painting a large sheet of paper and they're studying um, the trees. They're studying apple trees. So they're painting green for the leaves and they're looking at the colors of the leaves. And then they are painting what they see. Um, obviously, this is a cooperative effort, again, a reinforcement of core values. I mean, you, you can practically feel the cooperation, which is what I love here. And then they're painting red for the apples on one end of the paper. In later phases of this particular project, they're going to be using scissors to cut the shapes. They're going to be looking at the shapes of different leaves. They're going to be looking at the shape of the apples. And then they're going to be constructing a um, practically life-size tree in their classroom using a variety of materials. Another piece of the unit is they would be using counting. Um, they're integrating art, color study, um, and numbers in um, this on the left, left hand side of the screen. You can see the student doing um, an apple print. So they cut open the middle. They look at it from a scientific standpoint, how many um, seeds are there, what is the pattern, and then they're using that to create a piece of art. And on the right, the teacher is showing them they had a they had the week of three. That was the number of the week. So they're looking at a branch that actually has three intertwined um, pieces of branch. In pre-K, they're studying the origins of relationships. So the, the relationships between humans and animals, plants and trees, oceans and seashores. Those are the three distinct units. This picture shows a um, local farmer coming in to show the students what the insides of some of the plants look like and how they grow and what the leaves and vines are on the particular plants. 
Normally the uh, pre-K students would go to the apple orchard and pick apples. This year they couldn't go to the apple orchard. So the um, milk pail brought the orchard to us and <laughs> planted some apples in trees uh, throughout campus. And the students went and picked them and put them in their, um, their cute little uh, paper buckets. Another part, obviously, of the uh, pre-K nursery curriculum is outdoor time, you know, um, physical play, and um, we love our tricycles and the big, the big spot we have in the middle of campus to ride those around. In kindergarten, we're getting into creation, elemental forces, and symbols. In this picture, the student is um, writing a reflection of weekend activities. They come in every Monday and do that. Um, I was intrigued by the teacher was talking about um, what uh, paper materials are available in the classroom. So there isn't just paper, colored paper and you know, regular eight and a half by 11 paper. She has correspondence cards and envelopes and lists and different types of um, you know, things that we write on a, on a regular basis as adults. But she's showing them, you know, these are the these are the things that you need to learn writing for. So it gives them a goal. I just thought it was really cool how you know that um, it it's it's so much more than we think, right? There's so much more to literacy than you know than just teaching letters and how to write on a piece of paper. In grade one, they study patterns and cycles. So. Um, Examples would be studying tree rings or recognizing ritualistic patterns in cultural traditions. Um, patterns can be dynamic and, um, you know, they study seasonal cycles, they study the water cycle. In this particular example, they were studying um, tessellating patterns in a tortoise shell um, or a beehive and a tessellating pattern I had to look this word up because it wasn't part of my education as a child, but tessellating patterns are when they don't, um, there are no gaps or overlaps. So if you think of a tortoise shell as being a very distinct pattern that doesn't have any overlapping um, patterns. So in this particular example, the students used a batik method to create their tessellating pattern. They also used um, wax resist and watercolor. So you can just see how one sort of scientific concept becomes um, a you know, concept in art, becomes a concept in, um, in other ways. In grade two, they are studying systems. They start with the Big Bang. So um, the, this particular project, and this is a photo from this year, as you can see with all their masks and distanced um, desks. They read um, how the universe was born, born with a bang, and they, um, they do their own interpretation of what the Big Bang was. This is another project example of the solar system. They actually acted out in a play. And one of the interesting things about the grade two curriculum is, you know, the they're looking at individual things, like for instance, an individual planet, but they're also looking at how that plays into the entire solar system. And they're equally looking at how they as individuals are you know, emerging learners and, and, and people and you know, what do they have to offer in the world, but also how do they operate as a group and what groups do they fit into? You know, they fit into a family, they fit into a community, they might be on a soccer team, they're certainly part of you know, the Ross community. So you know, these are the concepts that they're, that they're examining. In grade three, we're looking at the evolution of life. Um, they also do a certain amount of um, looking at the present day um, US history. Um, right now, they, they, um, they just finished a state presentations. So each student had to choose a state and you know, what was the, what's the flower, what's you know, um, their uh, symbol, they, you know, what's the bird, you know, all of the different, where's their capital, and what matters to them, what resources do they produce in that state, what are they known for, historical um, events that happened in that state. So, and then in music class, of course, they're going to be learning the 50 Nifty United States. Remember that song? It's <laughs> the one I can't get out of my head from when I was a kid. Um, but not only that, they're, you know, they're really tying everything together, cultural history and English, they're going to be reading 
texts that um, you know that are narratives of of you know fictional um, historical um, stories. So they're really getting a sense for for time periods and what things might have been like in a certain time period, and getting that um, you know that real really well rounded understanding of a topic. I love this photo because it shows. Um, one of the, they have to act out uh, tribal rituals. And um, I think this was actually part of a death ritual. And in the next photo in this collection, the, the student was lying on the ground and pretending to be dead. But as they understand these tribal rituals, it gives them a context for, you know, how civilizations developed and, you know, what are they centering? What are humans centering around? They're centering around the things that happen. And, you know, then they were building on that. So, um, in fourth grade, they're looking at social systems and agriculture. So that means things like calendars, clan rituals, migration, cave art, and origin stories. So on the left, we have an example of the, um, the Gabon Viper clan. That's um, the, and on the, um, on the right, they did uh, cave paintings. So they, they look at the colors that, that were available to them. They're looking at from a scientific point of view, you know, what were the materials that were available for cave painting. They're looking at the history of cave painting in, um, you know, in art history. Um, obviously, they'd be looking at, you know, they'd be doing this project in art, but it's an interdisciplinary project where they're studying from other um, areas of study. This is an example of origin stories of spirit animals. And I like this page from a book because it shows, you know, real understanding of, um, of these tribal rituals. This looks like, as I was mentioning before, a death ritual. So, you know, they're just continuing to expand on that understanding of how civilizations operate. We do a lot of cultural celebrations, um, you know, things like um, Chinese New Year, um, you know, different uh, cultural moments in the community. When the seventh graders are studying the Maya, they have a day called Maya Day and everyone enjoys, um, you know, a meal that is prepared that is specifically based on Mayan food and, and Mayan um, culture, but the entire community participates. So it's, you know, it's not just the seventh graders that are doing that, it's, it's everybody. Um, we have assemblies once a month in, in the lower school, and it's an opportunity for buddies. Um, buddies, you know, you've probably heard of this in other places, you know, the older kids to go and read to the younger kids, and it's really a nice way for them to, um, you know, to really bond and, and have some, someone to look up to or someone, you know, it's, it's great confidence builder for older kids to have a younger child to, um, you know, to be helping along. It gives them a lot of a lot of confidence in what they can do. We do have differentiation and um, learning support. So if your child, for instance, has an IEP and they have, um, they need a reading specialist or um, an occupational therapist, that's something we can work with through our uh, director of student support and coordinate. Um, differentiation for all students happens starting in grade one for math and for uh, reading. The students will be evaluated and put in different groups. And so for the students who need more of support, they get more support. For the students who need more of a challenge, they get more of a challenge. And there are two different teachers in the room at the time that, that um, that's happening. So you have you know, even smaller group work. If you had say 11 students, you know, half of the students are gonna be in one group and half in another. So it's, you know, there's really very, um, you know, a nice intimate connection between the teacher and the students. In the lower school, we have specials. This is where they learn their language, music, visual arts, theater arts, wellness, science, library. As I said before, you know, the, um, there's an, um, you know, the, the integrated projects and the hands-on curriculum, you know, many of these teachers are gonna be working together to coordinate what they're doing. So when they're talking about the monarch butterfly in science, they're also talking about migration patterns in history. They're gonna be painting, you know, those monarchs in art. They're going to be singing about them in music. They're gonna be talking about them in Spanish. They're gonna be singing about them in Mandarin. So, you know, it's a very, um, 
very well-rounded way to learn. I think I've said that maybe, <laughs> maybe too many times now. Um, the students are learning Mandarin from nursery on up, uh, Mandarin and Spanish, and then they choose their language. I believe in kindergarten, they choose Mandarin or Spanish. Wellness is very important to us. Mrs. Ross believed in Eastern wellness as, um, as much you know, as any kind of physical exercise. So um, you know, as I said before, the students learn meditation, but they're also gonna be learning games and drills and you know, all those, those um, usual physical education skills. N music, um, they're gonna be doing general music until grade three. In grade three, they will choose an instrument, either the recorder, a wind instrument, a string instrument. And then they're gonna be doing small group lessons, which are called pullouts. And they're doing that during the school day. So um, it's a nice way for them to learn. If your child wants to learn the flute, they're gonna be learning in a you know, much smaller group than you know, in the big, um, in the full class. Wanted to show you a little bit of the campus. I explained before that right now we're on the Bridgehampton campus, um, Butter Lane. So there's you know plenty of outdoor space, some beautiful buildings. Um, right now we're really excited to have these buildings that have um, an exterior door from every single classroom. So there is no reason for students to have to cross each other in the hallway. Um, they each have their own individual bathrooms in each of these classroom suites. So I think that's a you know really nice feature of these buildings. Um, right now they have um, beach chairs outside of all of the of the um, classroom doors, and that's what, how they experience their lunch times or some of their meetings. They can even you know get their computers out there because the they've figured out how to make the Wi-Fi reach. So. Um, it's been nice to have, you know, take advantage of the outdoors. I love this picture of, this is Charlie. He's, um, he's one of our students with a clipboard. You know, they're, they're not just looking at the garden and, you know, tasting the herbs. They're, you know, they're counting things. They're tallying. They're, you know, they're really examining. And it's nice to have this great campus to take advantage of that. So under normal circumstances, the Ross Cafe serves lunch. This year, we are bringing our own lunches for safety reasons. Um, but the Ross Cafe stands for regional, organic, sustainable, and seasonal. It's not to say that we're always organic, but to the extent that we can be, we try. And um, you know, the seasonal refers to the local farms that provide a lot of the food. We also rely on local um, fish markets and um, local poultry providers. So it's you know, to the extent that we can, we use people around where we are. And um, we have a garden um, in the East Hampton campus. The cafe overlooks a beautiful spiral garden. And there's food from our garden that actually goes into our lunch, which is just the most amazing thing to see, you know, for students to see the connection between what's right outside the window and what's on their plate. So many parents ask about transportation, you know, is there a bus to Ross School? So the deal is if you live within 15 miles of campus, your school district is supposed to bus you to Ross School. Typically, there's no charge for this. It's something you sign up for in April or May of um, the school year before, you know, before the fall. And um, the, um, the process is, you know, it's, it's through your district. It's not really through us, but we provide you the tools to go and make that request. Um, this year, we have a shuttle going between the East Hampton and Bridgehampton campus for families who um, didn't expect to be, you know, taking their kids to Bridgehampton if they live in, you know, Amagansett or Montauk. And um, so we've had to shuttle between the two campuses so they can drop off the students in East Hampton and we'll bring them over to Bridgehampton. This, by the way, is our head of um, lower school, Jeanette Tyndall, hugging a student. <laughs> it's not the bus driver. Um, I thought it was kind of a sweet moment. Um, she's much beloved by, by the students. Parents always ask me, what are the opportunities for me as a parent? Um, you know, how can I get involved? And there are multiple ways to get involved. It is really a community in the truest sense of the word. Um, I am not sure how much we're seeing it this year. I think a lot of the events are virtual, but in, you know, in 
any other year, um, you know, we have parents night out at Barron's Cove, you know, it's just cocktails and, you know, just bring yourself and whatever you feel like talking about. We have parent forums where it's kind of a chance to ask questions, you know, why is the, you know, Spanish program working this way or when will my child be, you know, moved to the other math group or what have you. Um, the parent association does events, they um, sponsor, um, scholarships for field academy for uh, upper school students they um, will bring they'll have like a uh, the veterans breakfast they'll have um, a thanksgiving lunch they do teacher appreciation week um, there are lots of things that are involved and they bring Lama Tenzin when he, in the years that he's been able to come to campus um, the parents association has sponsored that um, you also have classroom visits in, in any other year. We've had classroom visits, I think it's the last Friday of the month from eight to nine, where parents are invited to come into the classroom and just see what their students are doing. You know, we believe totally in putting their art on the wall and putting their compositions on the wall and you know, really have them reflect on their work, but it gives you a chance to come in and say, oh my gosh, look at all these things you did. I, when you, you get in the car after school and I say, how was school? And you say, fine, what did you do? Nothing. How many parents have heard that? So this is your chance to prove them wrong. I love this photo of just these small moments happening in, um, you know, with our very youngest students and the freedom they have to create, you know, you can see in the background, um, that's one of the stations in the nursery classroom and they just can come in and freely paint. You know, that's it's not something I would let my kids do at home. It's too messy, but what a great way to start the day, you know, just free painting. So looking ahead, if you are looking at Ross School as a, you know, a, a starting point in the early grades for, you know, your child's education um, right through high school, there is a lot that happens um, after they leave the lower school and graduate up into the middle and high school. Field Academy travel courses, um, that's two to three weeks in uh, the spring typically. It's open for seventh through 12th graders and the opportunities are phenomenal. Uh, my son has been to Spain, to Africa. Um, he went to um, Taos, New Mexico and spent time with the on the Taos Pueblo and volunteered in the Taos Pueblo School, like just incredible. Um, in Zimbabwe, he did Hoops for Hope. So they're just incredible opportunities for our students to expand and sort of experience what Mrs. Ross set out to, um, you know, to teach her daughter, which is, you know, go somewhere and learn things there, immerse yourself. Senior project is the, what most people call the capstone project of senior year. Um, it's where a student becomes an expert in something and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible to watch what they come up with and how they develop their ideas. We have over hundred elective courses, um, wide ranging number of topics, advanced courses um, to prep kids for AP, obviously college counseling and test preparation, um, although test preparation as we know it is, is evolving, um, and then college and university placement. So I just wanted to give you a quick stat of, um, you know, some of the, the current, well, last year's uh, graduating class. And these are some of the schools they attended. And this is the goal, right? <laughs> Even if your child is three years old, you want to get them here. And you want to get them here happy, engaged, and eager learners ready to learn more and forge into the future. I like this quote from, um, from Zoe Saunders. Um, I think it just really goes back to our inter interdisciplinary curriculum, the integrated projects, you know, the idea that you're not just one thing, you're many things. Um, one thing I didn't mention was Howard Gardner, who was the pioneer of the multiple intelligences, is one of our founding mentors. So you know, when the curriculum was written, um, one of the contributors was a chaos theorist. One was a mathematician and poet. Um, one was Howard Gardner, there were many others, but um, just, you know, sort of an interesting way to pull lots of different disciplines together in the minds of the mentors. Um, it reflects in the way that we evaluate, it's, it reflects in the way that we teach, you know, kids can be smart in, um, you know, they can be athletically smart, they can be mathematically smart, they can be art smart. And we 
you know, like to honor who they are and also push them in a direction that they might not have natively gone to. This is roughly the school calendar. We started around mid-September, we end around mid-June. I can make this calendar available if you wanna really look into it. Tuition, um, this is a little bit hard to see, but um, for K through four, it's 37,190. That's this year's tuition. Um, that will be voted on um, in December by the board, the tuition for 2021. Application requirements are fairly simple. You complete your application, submit your fee, a letter of recommendation for grades one and older, a report card for grade one and older, and then an applicant interview. So I've been doing interviews by Zoom. I know that a lot of children um, have a hard time with Zoom, especially the younger they are, because they don't have a chance to read my energy or you know, necessarily body language. So um, it can be challenging. So we've created a way for families to interview for the younger children, nursery through kindergarten. So it would be you know, family, whatever that means to you. You can bring the dog. Um, it's fairly informal, but you know, I just like to get to know your child it is going to be a competitive year. We um, anticipate a lot of the families returning, um, the families who are attending this year, which means that there will be a limited number of spots for each grade going forward. And um, you know, the more you can tell us about your child, the better. Um, I will be your main point of contact as the lower school admissions representative, and um, I'll put my contact information at the end here. Um, Application deadlines, January 15th, I would um, strongly encourage sticking to that so that you have the best chance of, you know, getting your name on that list if there is, um, you know, a limited number of spots. And then for those who are late to the game, we'll have rolling admissions after March 10th. I encourage you to connect with our Instagram and Facebook accounts so that you can sort of see the essence of Ross School in action at you know, any given time. And the application, ross.org slash apply, um, pretty simple to remember. And this is my contact information. You can email me anytime, lrson at ross.org. And um, let me know if you have any questions. I'm gonna stop my screen share and open it up to any questions that anyone might have. And you're, you can, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I had a question. Yes, absolutely. Hi, so nice to, to see you. And uh, my name is Stacy Kotler. We, as I'd mentioned, um, recently relocated from the city. So I'd be looking at fourth grade for my younger daughter and sixth grade for my older daughter they have had no spanish or um mandarin they're mm -hmm. at a jewish day school in manhattan so how, how would that work with the language component the teachers are accustomed to having students coming in at different levels so they're going to, you know, to the degree that they can in the earlier grades, they're going to individualize lessons. And, you know, for students who've had some, they'll push them. For students who haven't had any background in Spanish or Mandarin, they're going to, you know, help them along. So they're, they're used to it. Um, in the older grades, they're going to, you know, they're gonna level them. So they'll be, they'll be just like math, they would be put in different levels. So it's not uncommon that someone would enter a grade that have had no none of neither of those languages. Exactly. Yep. Right. Thank you. Sure. What other questions? I know there's some out there. I can't have answered every question. I have hey. one. Go ahead. You can go first. Oh, no problem. Hi, this is Pete Lafferty. Good to see you again, Liz. For the and uh, for the younger years, for pre-K, are you guys going to be out in Bridgehampton for the foreseeable future, or is it just till the COVID situation kind of abates? Um, my understanding at this time is that we are looking at being there next year also, you know, so this year and next year, and then after that, we'll be reevaluating. What we saw post 9-11 
was a huge surge in applications and in and enrollments. And then after two years, things kind of leveled out. So using that as a little bit of a um, an example, you know, for what this unique experience has been in the last year, um, you know, we're sort of looking at at that as um, as a way to figure out what's next. Is that for sure? Question? It does. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi. How are you? Great. Uh, you. For, for, firstly, I don't know if anything was said to me when I first logged in. I was having connectivity issues. Um, but uh, anyway, my question was, I want to hear a little bit more uh, about the, uh, the STEM offerings with the school. Mm -hmm. So in our um, high school, we have a STEAM certificate program, which involves taking several electives that um, all kind of fold into the STEAM um, concept. I'm not explaining that very well, but... Um, until then, you know, science, technology, you know, it's, it's all integrated into the curriculum. So um, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's integrated, it's part of it. So until high school, it's not really kind of teased out as a separate um, goal. Does that make sense? I'm just gonna look in the chat real quick and see if there are um, questions. So there's a question, um, larger enrollment <clears throat> in lower and high school than in middle school. Is middle school set up to accept the lower school size as they get older? Yes, um, as I mentioned before, you know, we're very adaptable and um, our spaces are adaptable, you know, our class sizes um, can fluctuate from year to year. So um, this year we have a slightly smaller seventh and eighth grade than we have in the past. Um, you know, I'm not really sure why, um, but we're poised, you know, to grow as um, the students who we have now move up. Um, as I said, there's a chance that, you know, families will move back to the city and that's you know, sort of the fluctuation of things as we saw in um, 2001, 2002, but, um, but yes, we are, we are able to accommodate the number of students who would be moving up. Keeping in mind that, you know, even in third grade right now, we have 22 students. So um, if those students, you know, if there was no attrition and all of those students moved up and became seventh graders, you know, there would be 22 to 24 of them. You know what I mean? There's, you know, it's not, um, it's not like the classes are going to get so, so big um, that we can't accommodate them. So I see, um, I asked a question earlier, who are your favorite artists? And um, so I have some answers over here, which is pretty awesome. Thank you for answering. Um, I think one of the misconceptions about Ross School is that it's an art school. I hear this a lot from parents and um, it's not an art school per se. It's, it's an integrated discipline school. It's, a, it's integrated domains. Um, you know, the, the lessons they're learning, maybe they manifest themselves creatively. You know, maybe students are dressing up or acting things out or representing things in an artistic way. But the way they understand it is, you know, from a mathematical perspective and a cultural history perspective. And um, I think, you know, one of my favorite examples is um, in ninth grade, they do a unit on three point perspective. And they're learning about the cultural significance of the change in religious art to, a, you know, a different, um, a, you know, sort of a new way of, of seeing art. And three-point perspective was a huge part of that. But instead of just looking at it and saying, oh, yeah, these paintings are great and look at how they changed, they bring in a math teacher, they have a history teacher and an art teacher in the same room at the same time talking about these paintings and talking about the mathematical um, calculation that makes three-point perspective actually work. The, you know, painting technique that was employed to represent it and the cultural significance of the change from sort of a socio-political point of view. And I love that because um, that's, you know, 
that's what it's about. That's, that's the crux of it. You don't just see something from one point of view, you, you know, you're looking at it from lots of different perspectives. Any other questions right now? Mm -hmm. uh, just a question on science and technology and tech lab. Are those types of curriculum, are they, are they offered in the lower school? There are opportunities, yes. Um, we don't have a designated innovation lab space per se for the lower school students. <laughs> this year, um, well, normally they, they would have regular science lab so they would, you know, go to the lab or they would go outside with microscopes and, you know, gather up things and go examine. Um, in the older grades, they have the innovation lab, which has 3D printers and things like that. For the lower school students, um, I spoke about meeting on um, Fridays for assemblies. They also have makerspace, which is something they do with their buddies. And that is intended to, you know, to be a time for them to explore steam concepts and innovation so there might be a table of, you know, of Lego Technics, there might be a table of circuits or, you know, a potato, a lemon and a battery and some wires and a light bulb, you know. Um, so there, yes, there are opportunities for that. There also are some, um, there have been after school programs in innovation where lower school students can take part in the innovation lab um, just as a, you know, an after school class. Great, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm going to um, paste two links into the chat and um, right now, the Spiral Interactive, which I strongly encourage you to go and play with and just see it's, it's a really, um, it's really the best way I think to just see where things go um, different you know I talked about the um, tessellations in the first grade curriculum that concept reappears in eighth grade when they study the Alhambra and they look at mosaic and um, you know it's it's the spiral interactive will show you some of those links that go between grades um, and then it obviously, will, as I said, will show you how the domains intersect, intersect at different um, places throughout the units in the curriculum. So that's pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing tool that the whole, the whole curriculum is digital, um, digitized and, and able to be seen this way. The other link is the application. So I would encourage you to apply and please reach out to me with any questions. Um, I will type in my email address here. There we go. Thank you so much for joining today. I hope I hit all the topics and answered your questions, but please certainly follow up with me if you have any other questions to follow up. Thank you. Take care.